Hi, uh, my name is Jong Woo Kim. I'm from Kit Fox Games, and I'm here to talk about a cruel fate, emergent tragedies in the Shrouded Isle. Uh, just a quick note about our studio. We're based out of Montreal, and uh, previously we released a Moon Hunters, uh, which is a co-op action RPG with a proced uh, procedurally generated world and uh, trait-based role-playing mechanics. Last year, we had a highly successful Kickstarter campaign for Boyfriend Dungeon, which is a dungeon crawler crossed with dating sim. But uh, today, we're going to talk about something very different. Uh, has anyone played the Shroud at all? Some of you? OK, I'm going to play the trailer anyway, because you know I get to do that. Oops, let's see. Here we go. Too much power tripping. Uh, sorry. I'm just going to drag back my notes here. Uh, here we go. Oops. All right, um, so as you saw in the trailer, the Shrouded Isle is a human sacrifice cult simulator. <laughs> you play as the high priest of this uh, small island village that worships a slumbering dark god. And in preparation for his awakening, you try to maintain the faith of your people, maintain the loyalty of the five great houses of the village, and make a human sacrifice at the end of each season. The project began as an entry for a game jam back in 2015. We really loved the concept, uh, so we decided to fully develop the game. So in uh, August 2017, the full version of the Shrouded Isle was released for uh, PC and OS X. Later that year, due to positive reception, we released a free expansion pack called Sunken Sins. And just recently, uh, in January, uh, we released a Switch port of the Shrouded Isle, and in March, uh, we released it for uh, Japan region as well. So what do I mean by emergent tragedies, and what does that have to do with the Shrouded Isle? It goes back to the game jam. The theme was, you are the monster. And instead of making a game about a physical monster, we wanted to explore why someone makes monstrous choices. Why does the leader of a community take actions that clearly harm members of that community? And in tackling that theme, we wanted to maintain looter narrative congruence, which is to say that the narrative is told through the gameplay. But you, you might be more familiar with the more common term, ludonarrative dissonance, in which the narrative is undermined by the mechanics. So our creative goals were difficult to achieve because we needed to pick, depict this uh, dystopian society of the cult. But a lot of the design references we could find had this underlying utopian or heroic assumptions and had the risk of undermining the uh, tragic narrative that we wanted to tell. To give a quick comparison, we wanted to depict a stagnant society that tries to control and constrain its people. By contrast, utopian games tend to uh, focus on growth through the empowerment of a protagonist or the expansion of a community. We wanted to explore the divisions within the cult, what political games are being played, who is seen as virtuous or sinful. But most games we found depicted unity or assumed unity instead, whether it's a band of adventurers or an army that's loyal to a greater cause. Most importantly, though, uh, we wanted the gameplay to depict failure, telling a story about a corrupt society in which the leaders do whatever it takes to maintain their regime. But the majority of examples we found had an underlying message of triumph. 
depicting victory over an evil foe or prosperity of a community. So why make emergent tragedies? Because it allows us to depict dystopias and moral grayness while achieving ludonarrative congruence. The narrative is told through the gameplay. We can make more impactful experiences than scripted content because the player becomes an active participant and thereby causes their own downfall, or in rare cases, succeeds at an immense cost. But doing this is very challenging because we have to find alternative gameplay elements to replace key aspects of utopian design. So this talk will be analyzing three gameplay elements that were used in the Shrouded Isle to create emergent tragedies. So first we'll look at how physical resources were replaced entirely with psychological resources. Then we'll talk about the core gameplay, examining how process-oriented mechanics were replaced with character-oriented mechanics. Finally, we'll talk about progression systems. Spatial expansion or tech upgrades were substituted with progression through information gathering. So let's first talk about resources. In the Game Jam version, two of the town's resources were physical, food and shelter. This was a sensible need for the town, but it was too easy for the player to stock up and fill the bar and imply a state of prosperity for the town. And we could have balanced the resource management to make uh, the state of prosperity difficult to achieve, but there was a deeper problem in that directly managing food and shelter really felt irrelevant to a cult leader's interests. So in the final release, we replaced all physical resources with psychological resources. This way, the core economy of the game revolves around what a cult leader would care about, faith and politics. So in the bottom row there, you see the five virtues of the cult, ignorance, fervor, discipline, penitence, and obedience. These variables are affected by the actions and traits of the townspeople. If characters behave virtuously, the bars go up. If they behave sinfully, the bars go down. If the bar slips below the threshold for too long, the people lose faith in the cult and the game ends. The upper row holds the political resources, the, five great, uh, the opinions of the five great houses of the village. So on the far left, you'll see that House Kegney feels satisfied with the regime, while uh, the neighboring House Yosepka in the second column feels merely neutral. When you bestow favor on a house by using their members as advisors, their opinions go up, and their opinion goes down when you exclude them or kill members of their family for this seasonal sacrifice. If any house's opinion drops too low for too long, they revolt and the game ends. So the big benefit of using psychological resources is that the player embraces the values of the cult implicitly. Even if the player personally disagrees in the real world that raising ignorance is a good thing, they quickly learn that it is absolutely necessary for their cult to survive in the game. Furthermore, they are the psychological resources are divorced from objective reality or survival of the townspeople. So as a result, the player's narrative interests are dissociated from the villagers' narrative interests, which motivates the players to make uh, rather Machiavellian decisions when difficult situations arise. There's a further benefit in that you can keep the game in a state of volatile stagnation. As opposed to having an economy that just keeps growing and growing and growing over the course of a playthrough, the overall size remains relatively stagnant or even in slight decline. So at the same time, the individual resources have high volatility so that the crises in the game emerge dynamically. So let me give you a quick example. I'm going to select Chessa on the very far left of the advisors list as uh, my lead advisor this season. She belongs to House Kegney, so she specializes in burning books. If she succeeds, she'll raise ignorance by a moderate amount this month. She's also personally a sadist, so she'll raise a fervor significantly by her example. This is really great because fervor is dangerously low right now. She is also rebellious, which is a major vice. By using her as an advisor, her, um, her example will reduce obedience of the town below the critical threshold and therefore create an overall disobedience problem for the village. In terms of politics, House Kegney will understandably be uh, very happy that uh, you entrusted Chessa to lead the town and they become zealous supporters of your regime. In exchange, every other house is somewhat insulted and uh, envious and counterbalances the economy. In the Effersons case, it pushes them down 
uh, so much, or rather like just enough so that uh, it breaks their camel's back, so to speak, and they will rebel next season. So maybe choosing Chessa isn't the best option right now. As we saw with the example, a simple choice of who should lead the town for a month was given a complex nuance because of the volatility of the individual variables. Each gain is counterbalanced by a comparable loss in other variables. So while having the high volatility for the individual variables, we avoid having a spiraling growth or collapse, which would unbalance the gameplay and also undermine the narrative. And we theoretically could have done this with uh, physical resources, but I find that psychological resources are far easier to justify as having this volatility that I needed. Because it's easier to explain that Chessa is a fervent person who sometimes goes too far and tends to be disobedient and rebellious, rather than trying to justify why uh, gathering food would result in destruction of shelters or decay of shelters. Reigns is a game that uses psychological resources to depict tragic outcomes. The resources in the game simultaneously represent the physical amount of something as well as the faction strength. So for example, the sword represents the, uh, the physical size of your army as well as their relative political influence within your kingdom. If the bar is empty, your kingdom can't defend itself and becomes conquered by an invader. If the bar is too full, your general overthrows you in a coup d'etat. This careful balancing act combined with the volatile outcomes creates cascading crises. But at the same time, their economy is very fragile and strategic play is difficult without memorizing the card outcomes. So at some level, I do find that this undermines the player ownership of choices, but it works fine for Reigns because it embraces death with a whimsical tone and has a dynastic uh, meta progression system. So even if you die, you get something in the end. Moving on, let's talk about character-oriented mechanics. Utopian simulations tend to have process-oriented mechanics. Critical actions or systems in the game are abstracted industrial processes or are done through an organization. A residential zone is drawn, income is received every month, a research project is chosen and just completes over time. Even when characters are involved, they are largely interchangeable and only matter as far as how quickly they gather something or speed up a process. So going back to the Game Jam version for a second, at the time, we also had a very process-oriented game. The player gave orders at the house level, so like House Kegney would gather food, or House Yosefka would build shelters and so forth. And the results were calculated in aggregate because it really didn't matter how each house gathered a particular resource. This felt dissatisfying because similar with this, like similar to what we were talking about with the psychological resources earlier, it didn't seem like what a cult leader would want to do or care about. We wanted the player to engage with individual characters, judging for themselves whether a villager is virtuous or sinful. We wanted the player to have a reason to want to sacrifice somebody. So we changed the mechanic to be entirely character oriented instead. The goal was to dramatize resource management by having the player act through or act upon characters whose behavior was fundamentally unpredictable. While the player can order characters to do something, they can't fully control what they do or what the outcome will be. So let's go back to Chessa again. So in this playthrough, I don't really know her very well, but I'm still going to select her as a representative for House Kegney. I'm, I'm going to need her help desperately this season because ignorance is at a critical level and members of House Kegney are responsible for raising it. As I don't know her very well, it's going to be hard to predict how she will impact the town. We know that because she's part of a, the Cagney family, she will most likely raise ignorance. But we don't know how severe her vice is. According to rumors, as you can see on the like, second trait under her name, she is rumored to be disobedient. So I'm just going to trust for now that it's not too serious. Unfortunately, Chessa screws up. She fails to find enough books to burn, and instead of raising ignorance, she actually reduces it instead. Not only that, her vice might be severe. We don't know exactly what she did, but she completely reduced the town's obedience. This is an infuriating outcome, because not only did she fail at what I trusted her to do, she turns out to be a terrible sinner who is misleading my people. I trusted Chessa because I was, as the player, I was engaged with her at every single step. I personally appointed her, and then I personally ordered her to burn books. 
Due to the stress, I had a certain expectation of her, which she did not fulfill. I felt betrayed by her because she was an individual that did this, and that she was personally connected to me with the, as a result of my orders to her. If an industrial process or an organization resulted in this outcome, I would only have myself to blame. But due to having character-oriented mechanics, we add a dramatic context to what would otherwise be a really banal resource acquisition action. Another game that uses character-oriented mechanics to tell emergent narratives about expectations and betrayal is, of course, Darkest Dungeon. The player sends parties of adventurers down to these deadly crypts, and for the most part, the characters will obey the player's orders. However, as the, their stress rises from all the horrors that they encounter, the party gains afflictions, which are negative traits uh, that uh, permanently change how the character behaves. So for exa example, um, being hopeless not only causes debuffs to the character, it causes the character to ignore the player's orders. Having one character with an affliction is manageable, but it snowballs very quickly, and eventually, unless you pull out, the entire party will be full of afflictions. One thing that Darkest Dungeon does well is counterbalancing this, subverting this with the mechanic of uh, virtues. So there's a small chance that instead of gaining an affliction, you gain a positive trait, which boosts the party instead. So for instance, being courageous as opposed to being hopeless. By doing so, the game subverts the player's ex negative expectation in a positive way, creating emergent narratives of heroism and turnabout. Moving on, let's talk about progression systems. We looked at two conventional approaches, which would have been to go wide and allow for spatial expansion and go tall and allow for upgrades. But thinking about it, it felt incompatible with the narrative because the island is isolated from the world and has a dwindling population due to ritual sacrifices. To have a progression system without uh, having the cult grow in any way, we decided to use information. The way it works is through the townspeople and their traits. So let's take Bogdan here for an ex example. At the start of the playthrough, we might not know anything about Bogdan's behavior. But as the cult leader, the player has the right to investigate excuse me, uh, investigate members of their uh, village for their behavior. So if we inquire about Bogdan's virtue, the next, at the next stage, uh, he be, we understand that uh, he's rumored to be obedient. But we still don't know exactly how much he will affect the town's obedience until we inquire about him again, and then it's revealed that he is timid and will add five points uh, of obedience every season. Through revealing traits, the player is given subjective rewards. The characters themselves do not change at all. They behave exactly the same, no matter how much their trait has been revealed. Instead, the player's perception of that character changes. Since the player can most, more accurately predict the character's impact, they can make better decisions as they reveal more traits. There's also a change in the villager's perception of that character in the final phase. So if the player unveils the fullest extent to, of a character's uh, virtue or vice, it changes the bonuses and penalties in the sacrifice phase. So let's go back to Chessa. She drained the town's obedience because of her vice, but we don't know exactly what that vice is yet. When we inquire about it, we discover that she is rebellious. This is a major vice. At the end of the season, we have to choose one of the five advisors to sacrifice. And I'm going to make an example out of Chessa. Because I've exposed that she is rebellious, I'm able to make her family grudgingly accept this final outcome. Furthermore, her village, sorry, uh, her death will send a message to the village, restoring some of the lost obedience. With Chessa's death, justice is served and the villagers have learned a lesson. As you saw, the benefit of using information progression is that it allows us to temporarily blind the player. By giving access to incomplete information, we can create scenarios in which players' good intentions go terribly wrong. It's in the player's best interest to gain information, so therefore, the player is motivated to get to know the characters, which adds support to the character-oriented mechanics that we talked about in the previous section. And granted, this approach can be frustrating if the situation is completely opaque or unreadable, but the gameplay remains fair 
as long as the player is given some information and has active means of acquiring more. In fact, I would say that uh, the player is rewarded for being prudent and having foresight as long as they can make reasonable assumptions about the missing information. Probably the single best example of information progression is Return of the Aberdeen. The player is trying to figure out the fate of the crew and passengers on the Aberdeen by using a magic pocket watch to go back to the moment of their death. By carefully observing the uh, uh, snapshot flashbacks for what the characters say, what they do, and who they, whom they associate with, the player slowly pieces together faces with names until the truth is revealed. The game discourages guessing by only confirming your answers in sets of three and directly warning the player if not enough information has been found to be able to actually identify the character. All the same, an astute player is able to make reasonable predictions about a character's identity long before having enough evidence based on their appearance, occupation, and the language that they speak. So to bring this all together, emergent tragedies allow players to create their own downfall. We can tell narratives about dystopias and moral grayness, not through scripted content, but through gameplay itself. Psychological resources are the key, the fundamental step in this, and that it encourages players to embrace alternative paradigms and discourage min-maxing. Even if the player personally does not agree with the values of the cult in the Shrouded Isle, they must implicitly accept them within the game as their survival and success depends on them. Character-oriented mechanics then dramatize this resource management. By having most, if not all, mechanics in a game revolve around characters, we can tell powerful narratives about expectation and betrayal. Finally, progression through information allows players to improve over time without direct empowerment. Instead of gaining more resources through spatial expansion or refining them through technological upgrades, players effectively become more intelligent through the course of a playthrough by being able to better predict the consequences of their actions. This also creates opportunity in the middle of the playthrough for good intentions to go terribly, terribly wrong. For our latest project, we've taken principles from the Shrouded Isle and adapted them for the mystery genre. It's an experimental project that focuses on subjectivity of testimonies and relies entirely on information progression. If you're curious, we'll be showcasing a seven minute demo at the Experimental Gameplay Workshop on Friday. That's it for the talk, thank you very much. I think we have time for questions. I, uh, the microphone is in the middle. I'm just curious, you've got a game about dystopia and mechanics that are, you know, about managing psychological needs. Did you ever have confusion when uh, playtesters were playing to try to determine, like, what, what constitutes a win in your game? Like, how do I make a decision that I know is, is does the game think this is a good decision? It seems like a bad decision. Are you asking, like, were there cases in which the player, were, uh, player was con uh, confused about the, uh, the purpose of a certain resource or the, uh, the goal of the game? Is More like the, the goal of the game. Okay. Like, um, was the intention to leave players kind of wondering whether or not they're progressing to what would be defined as a win state? Or is that kind of part of the purpose of the game that the players are questioning? Am I winning this game? Am I, you know, clearly I get, get you know, the bars below the threshold and I lose, but like, what is the sum of the correct decisions that I've made and is that gonna take me to something that constitutes a win or at the end, do I just feel like a bad person? Okay, so to summarize then the question is, uh, were there confusions uh, by players about the goal of the game and was that intentional uh, like as mm -hmm. far as the experience is concerned? Um, I would say that at the start of at the start of development, it was not intentional, but as we observed playtests and that we found that uh, by the second playthrough, players grokked it, or just sur the survival of the first season of the players grokked it, we just uh, embraced that side of the game. Mm -hmm. An interesting anecdote for me is that I often observe that uh, the player tends to embrace their inner tyrant 
on by the second season. So the first season of a game, uh, you know, like people will try to be good, whatever that means. Uh, but then they realize that, hey, being good in my sense doesn't actually help me be successful in this game. And then their mindsets shift, and it's a bit uh, disconcerting, uh, <laughs> like uh, disconcerting to watch. Uh, but I mean. In some ways, it's a success. In other ways, I wish that there was a moral, like a longer moral dilemma that happened, and that would be the intended experience from my perspective. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, so sort of bouncing off that first, I love the game, thank you for making it. The game made me turn into a bad person, which is normally hard in RPG games for me. But something I noticed is that, yeah, like around the second season, I began to feel more apathetic because I was embracing this like dictatorship role in the community. And it began to in some way sort of conflict with some of my gameplay behavior because I was developing a kind of apathy to the characters, to the world because I wanted to succeed so well. So I was curious if you had any thoughts on how, you know, I think this awesome goal of having people embrace this more darker side of leadership and playing with apathy as a narrative construct can sometimes conflict or maybe in some ways enhance the apathy that we can develop as a player. And if that's something that is negative or if that's something you think we can gain some cool experiences from. Okay. Uh, so is the. Sorry, I'm just trying to grok the full question here. Yeah. Um, so is the question something like, uh, given that like there's a certain apathy or a distance that like uh, that's like inherent uh, to yes. the structure of the game, um, how like how do I feel about that as far as like a design choice or yes, like, and how does that conflict with oftentimes as game designers we want the opposite of that for gameplay, right? So right, how right. does that apathy that you get as being this protagonist conflict with the gameplay apathy and just if you have any thoughts about that? Right. Um, so. The interesting thing about that is that uh, I often find that uh, p players have a very, let me rephrase this, certain players have uh, a certain desire to be empathetic with mm -hmm. the characters. Mm -hmm. So the generation of the characters are, it's very, very simple in the Shroud at all compared to like a roguelike, let's say, or like a dwarf, compared to something like Dwarf Fortress, like it doesn't hold a candle. But there's a portrait, there's two traits, one positive, one negative. And for many players, that's enough to perceive a personality mm -hmm. within that. And P players tend to get attached to um, those personalities. And um, we also have a system where you can rename the characters. So in some cases, like, you know, you named this person after your friend. Are you really going to, you know? Uh, <laughs> and so that, that sort of attachment, I feel um, like there's just little things that adds up to a if you will, like certain threshold in which like, uh, the players become attached to that character. And so like, I didn't feel, for this project anyway, that the, uh, the, um, the apathy that you developed uh, uh, would like, conflict with my motivation. But yeah. if I were trying to make a game in which I wanted the player to deeply, deeply care about the people in the town, I, I would agree that um, the, um, um, the Machiavellian nature of the project uh, would have been a poor fit. Yeah, totally. Okay, thank you. Cool, thanks. No other questions? Um, you mentioned like um, randomness in the uh, in the like the different heads of the houses and things like that, and I was wondering if um, if it because uh, I haven't played it myself, but it looks really cool. Um, if it is just completely random of like you know. Given the context of the of the state of the world state of the game and you know the resources, you, you could get something really good. You could get something really bad. Or have you guys considered or tried to put in like you know any sort of AI that would kind of read the room and, and decide based off of what the players do and what they have what would be the most interesting you know traits to give something? Okay, so if I understand you right, is it like how did you balance the randomness versus like the intentionality of yeah. the project? Like if it's just, you know, pure, is it a full on slot machine of what you get or is there a little bit of like crafted behind it? I would say that um, initially I would have wanted to, the project to be as deterministic as possible other than the initial starting conditions for the town. But what I've observed over time is that the design space becomes very, very narrow and uh, the, in, because the game is about failure, right? Imagine if like, you're able to predict every outcome. Let's say we play rock, paper, scissors, right? And then I tell you, hey, I'm gonna play rock next turn. 
are, are you ever gonna use scissors other than for just for the fun of it, you know? Um, so in that way, like to keep the, um, the feeling of uh, being the leader in a terrible situation, like, uh, like as, um, as relevant as long as possible for the experience, like some amount of randomness was added. But for the most part, there is very little of it, I would argue. There's more uh, missing information. Right. If the player were able to have like all the town's uh, characters' traits from the get-go, uh, the, um, the lack of randomness in the Shrouded Isle would be more apparent, I'd say. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Since the Shrouded Isle deals a lot with um, kind of using gameplay that works with systems and kind of exploration, um, had you guys at Kid Fox ever considered like maybe like basing it on a like historically, you know, like power stru structures or systems or maybe like using this kind of gameplay to explore like kind of more historically bent ideas? So the question is, have we considered uh, exploring uh, historical situations and ideas uh, with a systemic gameplay like this, right? To tell you the truth, uh, for the Shrouded Isle, we didn't have something specific in mind. As I said, it came out of a game jam. Um, but what I find interesting is that after release, a lot of our colleagues kind of projected like what the game was actually about, like whether um, it's at a workspace or like you know like at a political party in particular or whatever. Um, I would want to like so I have a background in Soviet history. And so I do want to depict, uh, you know, a like single party structures. Like I think it would be a good fit for the Shrouded Isle, um, but we haven't moved further, like in pursuing those projects yet. But it's something that like we'd be definitely interested in. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, thanks for the talk. I I was wondering. You said uh, players took like a whole a whole act to really understand the game. What do you think that kept the players interested in the game uh, before they, they truly understand it? If I'm going to be blunt, uh, the art. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it, it's an interesting question. Um, so, we thought that the, um, so this, we showed the Shroud on multiple times at PAXs, and we were always surprised at the, uh, the relative amount of attention that a game about bars going up and down, frankly, uh, gets at a convention. Uh, and it's because of the striking art style and just like the harsh like, uh, nature of the game that so tickles like, uh, you know, the right parts of uh, brains, I guess. I, it's really hard to say. So honestly, I underestimated uh, the level of interest in this project. I thought that it would, it's too weird um, and uh, too cruel of a project. Uh, but overall, like I'm, I'm really gratified that uh, it's, uh, it's received the attention that it already has, frankly. Does that, does that answer the question? Cheers. Okay, that's it for the talk. Thank you very much. Um, please fill out your evaluations. And yeah.